Good morning, everybody. You can be seated. You can be seated. Praise the Lord. Um, we're going to go ahead and receive the morning offering for the ministry. And uh, you make out a check to the church here. No, the offering go towards uh, uh, Mark Hankins Ministries, the things we talked about some last night. And uh, thank God for your abundant blessing and generosity. Thank you so much. Y'all are y'all can uh, outgive a church ten times your size. I've been to some big churches. I said, y'all can out give a church 10 times your size. That's a pretty good deal right there. You know, some churches say, oh, that's a really big church. Well, but, but uh, you know, you can outdo a church 10 times your size. Amen. Amen. And so we thank y'all for your very generous giving all week. And uh, uh, it's just a great blessing and helps us do everything the Lord's called us to do. And so, uh, wow. And your pastors are just two of the best pastors and some, some of the most generous pastors that I know. And I, you know, my best friends are generous givers. I don't have no stingy friends. I have some stingy acquaintances, but I don't have no, well, unless it's on Facebook, but I don't have any stingy friends. I don't have any uh, stingy pastor friends. Uh, it's not so much uh, how much you give, but it's in relation to your ability. Amen. You just do the best you can do. And so we've got some wonderful, generous. But uh, these pastors here, these are pretty phenomenal pastors, and that's why they're getting some phenomenal results. Amen. Well, this is a great church in the country, ain't it? Amen. How many believe you can have a great church in the country? Amen. Well, you can't hardly find a church, but you can have a great church if you ever find it, <laughs> if, you, if you can ever get here. Amen? <laughs> and so... Uh, Wow, well, it's such a blessing to be here. Thank you, Pastor. And actually, tomorrow is me and my wife's anniversary tomorrow. Wow, my anniversary. I, that'll be how many years? 48. 48, but still love you. Oh, I love you, baby. You're the, you're the best. Always the best. Don't squeeze too much. Anyway, so 48 years and 48 pounds ago, praise the Lord. <laughs> uh, uh, now we met at Bible College my last semester, and it was her first. She was a freshman. I was a senior. And uh, immediately we uh, started going on some dates. And uh, on all of our dates, I would ask her what she knew about faith because I studied under Kenneth Hagin. <laughs> So I wanted to find out if she knew anything about faith. And uh, so we started talking about faith, started talking about who you are in Christ. And so uh, all of our dates were basically uh, studying the Word together, or we'd go to church together. And uh, we'd go to meetings together in Dallas area. And uh, so uh, we fell in love with Jesus, and then we fell in love with each other. I mean, if you love Jesus first, it's easier to love somebody else. I said, if you would love Jesus first, it's a lot easier to love somebody else. Amen. And uh, so thank God for 48 years. Wow. And wonderful, blessed two, two kids serving the Lord and preaching and ministering and then uh, eight grandkids. And so, wow, it's a blessing of the Lord. I mean, I mean, um, it's just more than you could ask or think. It's the goodness of God. Amen. God is faithful. Amen. He is so faithful, so good. So we're very thankful. But tomorrow, that's the day, baby. So uh, we're flying straight to Colorado Springs from here tomorrow morning and uh, stay at the Broadmoor Hotel in Colorado Springs. If you've never stayed there, you need to go to Colorado Springs and stay at the Broadmoor Hotel. It's the only five-star hotel in Colorado. And it's right, Colorado Springs, right before Pikes Peak, you know, on the mountains there. And while all the presidents stay there, all the lawyers, all the rich people stay there. So I figured I belong there. So I went, <laughs> amen, amen. Well, I know Motel 6 is leaving the light on, but we ain't coming. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, so we're going there for a little uh, happy anniversary party. Praise the Lord. Isn't that wonderful? My wife gets more beautiful every year. And we can't wait till next year. But as I see, it's more beautiful every year. Amen. And she looked beautiful. Now, she don't look like a grandma, you know. I, I kind of look like a grandpa, but she don't look like a grandma. People think I married my daughter or something, you know. 
Um, but it cost me a lot of money to keep her looking that way. So, <laughs> so th thank you. Thank you for your generosity. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Hallelujah. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, her and Dee kind of gang up on me, you know, my jokes. Some of my jokes. Um, uh, I do have a joke, you know. I have a mother-in-law joke, you know. You don't, you don't want to tell it? Oh, it's anniversary. I can't tell it. Um, how about the Cajun joke? Can I tell the kid? Not the, you don't want me to tell the bad one? Well, well, some people like the bad one. Oh, okay. Well, I can, if you sit at my table at lunch, I'll tell you the bad one. Not really a bad one. It's just she don't like it because it's something about the female side that a, a woman that uh, is in the swamp and, you know, and she found it. It's about Boudreaux. Anyway, uh, you know what. So um, I do have a joke for you this morning. I know this is not necessarily about the offering, but uh, this is about the guy who uh, he had a delivery business. He had a delivery business. Now, I got this joke from, uh, from Margaret Court's husband. And Margaret Court, if you know, if you're older probably, uh, she is the, uh, the greatest, winningest woman in professional tennis to this day. She still has one of the most matches. So we went to her house. She's got the Wimbledon U.S. Open. She's got all the, all the trophies all over her room, all underneath the bed. She has so many. So she's like, you know, she won all those things. And still the winning is women's tennis. They, they uh, have started to fight her the last few years because now she's uh, born again spirit filled. And she's a pastor in Australia. She's a pastor. So when they ask her, you know, about the lifestyle, then she says, no, God intended for marriage to be between a man and a woman, you know, not between two women, you know, not between two men. And so she speaks out. And so they attack her for that. But she's just speaking out. That, you know, they ask her and she tells them what the Bible says. God says. So Margaret Court, and she's probably uh, getting close to 80 now. When we fly in, she meets us at the airport, and she uh, rolls our luggage for us. Wow. She's very healthy. And I tell her, Margaret, you should be right. I am should be rolling. Oh, baloney, I got the luggage. And so she goes rolling it off. <laughs> and a uh, great, great woman of faith. And um, she was a great tennis champion, but she had a nervous breakdown winning all those championships. And her life was... Uh, falling apart, and at that point, she got saved, got filled with the Holy Ghost, amen, amen. and the Lord saved her life, then she got called to preach, she went to Bible school, and uh, so the news media was so amazed by this change in Margaret Court, because she's famous, so they actually followed her to her church, and they actually did a, a news report on her, and they got a uh, uh, a video of her hands up worshiping Jesus and talking in other tongues. So that became quite controversial. So she had to explain to him, the Lord saved my life. I got filled with the Holy Spirit. He gave me a supernatural language, a new language of prayer and worship and has saved my life. So now she has a church of probably about 5,000 people there in uh, Perth, Australia, Western Australia. Her husband, Barry, would be kind of equivalent to the governor of that state in Western Australia. His dad and his family, uh, uh, conservative, very influential in, in Western Australia. And uh, Barry is kind of like, uh, he's kind of like uh, Ronald Reagan. Uh, Ronald Reagan, if we only had him for four years, Ronald Reagan, whatever he's doing, Lord, if you could send him back. But <laughs> Ronald Reagan, when he had a staff meeting, then he would uh, make everybody bring a joke. So Ronald Reagan, if he had a staff meeting, he'd make every week, he'd make all of his staff bring a new joke. So some of them said, boy, that's kind of the greatest pressure I was under all week was to find a new joke, you know, to tell to uh, President Reagan and the staff. <laughs> so Barry's like that. Every time I get around him, he tells me a new joke. Well, he speaks in really Australian 
really strong uh, accent. And I'm just like, what? And so I can't understand him. So he repeats everything at least three times. So this joke in honor of Margaret Court and her husband, Barry, Barry said, did you hear about the guy who had a delivery business? He had a delivery business and well, a certain time of the year, he was so busy and he had these three penguins come in and he had to take those penguins to the zoo. And he was so busy, he was just like, I don't have time. How am I going to ever do this? I got so much other stuff to do. So he saw another guy with a truck, and he gave this guy $200 and said, look, I'll give you $200 if you'll take those penguins to the zoo for me. And so that guy said, oh, sure, I'll do that. So later on, this guy's driving downtown, and he sees that man walking downtown with those three penguins. Man, he pulls over his truck and says, hey, mister, he said, are you? Are you crazy? What's wrong with you? I gave you $200, and I told you to take those penguins to the zoo. The guy said, well, I did take them to the zoo. He said, but I had some money left over, so now I'm taking them to the movies. <laughs> so, yeah. Take them to the zoo. I took them to the movies. Anyway, so that came from, from Barry. So uh, the meat patty joke came from Barry Court. But I, he had to explain it to me like three times because I couldn't understand him. Um, and then he has a big mustache, so you can't read lips, you know. <laughs> the biggest problem with COVID is people wearing masks, and you can't read their lips. You're like, what? <laughs> and y'all listen and read lips? Don't lie, y'all. Like, like, uh. So uh, that was the problem with COVID. But anyway, um, uh, that's a, a joke from our friend. Take, so every time I'm taking my uh, grandkids to some kid movie they want to go to, then I always say, I'm taking these penguins <laughs> to the movies. <laughs> I'm taking these penguins to the movies. Sit up in the chair and be still. All right. So... Uh, what was I going to do? Okay, I'm going to receive the offer. But let me tell you, let me tell you uh, what happened to me as a young pastor is I had a rich man in my church. And, uh, uh, you know, to make a long story short. <laughs> that's because you all are slow learners. But, so... So I had a rich guy in my church, and uh, our church at that time uh, probably was bringing in around uh, $8,000 a week, something like that, you know, average maybe, $8,000 a week. So I knew, you know, I know bills to pay and staff and, and uh, stuff like that. So the rich guy, he was the biggest giver in the church, and he got mad at me because he wasn't just the biggest giver. He kind of wanted to tell me what to do. And I was like, uh, you know, I uh, uh, appreciate your generosity, but you ain't going to be telling me what to do. I mean, uh, I ain't for sale. I ain't even for rent. Besides that, I don't think you can afford me. So, uh, so he wanted to kind of tell me what to do all the time. So finally I told him, you know, well, I'll, I'll pray about those decisions and I'll make the decision. So he got mad and left the church. When he left the church, then I was sitting in my office and I was thinking, the biggest giver just left the church. I was just sitting in my office, and that's what I was thinking. I was a little bit depressed. Biggest giver just left the church. I got these bills to pay. The biggest giver left the church. And the Lord spoke to me really clear. He said, the biggest giver is still here. I said, well, I'd sure like to know who it is because I get the printout every Monday. <laughs> And the Lord said, it's me. The Lord said, I'm the biggest giver. And as long as I'm still here, you'll never lack for money. So I started to cheer up. Thank you, Lord. You're the source of my supply. As long as you're still here, I'll never lack for money. And immediately at that time, there was a little Hispanic lady that came and knocked on my door. She didn't go around through the secretary. You know, you got the little peephole there. So she kept knocking on my door. You know, I said, well, you're supposed to go talk to the secretary. She kept knocking on the door. 
And uh, so uh, I looked and I said, what does she want anyhow? Well, she hadn't been coming to church very long, uh, but she was standing there. So I finally answered her and said, yes, ma'am, can I help you? She said, she's crying. She said, the Lord told me to come right now and give you this sack. She said, I hear you teaching on tithe and offering. She said, and it just made me mad. <laughs> she said, it just made me mad. She said, I was not a tither. You know, I would give, you know, a little bit, but I'm not a tither. And so she said, it made me mad. But while I was at home today, the Lord said, he only gave you the word and the word is right and you are wrong. So you need to start tithing and giving. So she's crying. So she brought a sack full of money and said, this is my tithe and my offering. And my husband was just shipped off to Desert Storm in the military. And he's not saved. So I'm asking you, I'm going to bring the tithe. And I'm asking you to agree with me that he will get saved. So she's just crying. I agreed with her. Just a few weeks later, she said he got saved, filled with the Holy Ghost. Now he's going to a military uh, Bible study in uh, Desert Storm over there in the Iraq area. So he came back, and she went on with the Lord, right? But what the Lord told me was right when I was thinking about the rich man left the church, biggest giver's gone. She was there right that moment. And you know the scripture in Psalms, I'll think of it in a second exactly where it is. Scripture in Psalms uh, says, show me a token for good that my enemies may see it and fear the Lord. You know what a token for good is? That means it's not everything, but it's just to let you know God's working on the situation. So she gave me a sack with probably not maybe three or $400 in it, but the Lord said, that's a token that the money will come and you'll never lack for money. Do you want to know what happened? After the rich guy left the church, the biggest giver left the church, our church finances went from $10,000 a week to $20,000 a week. Then it went to $30,000 a week. Then it went to $40,000 a week. Then it went to $50,000 a week. Then it went to $60,000 a week. Then it went to $70,000 a week. Then it went to $80,000 a week. Then it went to $90,000 a week. Then it went to $100,000 a week. And I got up and asked if anybody else wanted to leave. <laughs> Are y'all still here? In, a, in other words, always remember the biggest giver is still here. Are y'all still here? So no matter who comes or goes, hey man, if you're teaching the word, praise the Lord, no matter who comes or goes, keep saying the biggest giver is still here. In other words, I really don't live on his giving. I live on my giving. Yes. Amen. As long as I'm generous, praise the Lord, God's going to multiply that. And so I always gave not just off my personal income, but I gave off the whole ministry. Yeah. Woo! That's got to be pretty fun. So, man, I'm giving off a whole ministry every week, sowing seed off the whole ministry, off of myself personally, and everything just kept increasing. Y'all know Proverbs 11, 24? What does it say? You know this scripture. I read it 30 years ago, and I had to read it five times. Uh, it's, it's actually in the book um, uh, uh, written on prosperity by Benjamin Franklin. One of our um, American founders, you know, and famous, and he wrote a book on prosperity. So I read Benjamin Franklin's Principles of Prosperity, and he's got one page on Proverbs 11.24. Y'all know Proverbs 11.24? King James says what? There is a scatters and yet increases. Y'all know that? Did they put it up there? All right, that's the King James. There is a scatters. And yet increases. There is that with holes more than is meat, and it tends to poverty. So I read it over and over. I mean, first time I read it, I was like, because I'm trying to figure out how God thinks about money. Because God don't think like people. Matter of fact, figure out how you think and do the opposite, and that's kind of what God thinks. Because God said, I don't think like white people. <laughs> oh, it didn't say white. He said, I don't think... Like black people. I don't think like Hispanic people. 
He said, I don't think like people, period. So when you read the word, you find out God really don't think like people think, right? So I was reading that, and I thought, well, how's he thinking here? What's God's way? He said, well, there's one that scatters and does what? Increases. So I sure don't want to increase. Thank you, y'all. Sure getting quiet. I'm not taking pledges or nothing, so don't get upset. So uh, uh, there is one that scatters and yet what? Increases. Do you want to increase? Come on, Dad Hagen said, I would be concerned if my faith was not increasing. In other words, kingdom of God's increasing. God wants us to increase. So if we're not increasing, you just say, well, Lord, is there some adjustments I need to make so I can have increase? Thank you. Y'all still quiet again. I don't know. No, no shouting, no running. Amen. At least, at least nobody's getting hit in the head. But anyway, so no. <laughs> Somebody got hit in the head last night. I'm not going to say who. <laughs> anyway, so <laughs> it's a five brews meeting. <laughs> Have y'all ever been in the Holy Ghost meeting? It's a five brews meeting. You're like, I think somebody <laughs> fell on me and somebody kicked me and I fell on my car keys and I hit a chair, but I sure am blessed. Anyway, so. Let's go back to this as a five bruise meet. <laughs> That's what we call Brother Hagin's meet. Sometimes he would lay hands on the whole row, and he'd start on this end, then the whole row would go down. So you always look to see who's standing in front of you, <laughs> right? And if they're all going down, you just step over to the side and let them go down. <laughs> anyway, you got to learn how to survive in these meetings. The, the Bible calls it watch and pray, you know. Never close your eyes when people are down there doing that kind of stuff. Even Jesus said what? Watch and pray. Amen. And even if you have kids, you know, while you're praising the Lord, you just look at your hands and say, praise the Lord. Come on, slap that kid and I praise the Lord. <laughs> All right, so let's get back to the scripture here. <laughs> there is a scatters and yet increases. Anybody believe in increase? How many believe that God actually could bring increase? Amen. So he says, here's, here's the category. There's that scatters and increase. There is that withholds more than is appropriate, and it tends to what? Poverty. So I said, well, where's poverty come from? Well, he said, you would think if you'd hold more, hold on to your money tighter, you'd have more money. All right, let's try that one more time. You'd think if you held on to your money tight, what? You'd have more money. All right. I don't know what, where y'all did arithmetic and stuff like that, math, but... Wouldn't you think that if you held on to your money tighter, you'd have more money? But God says if you hold on to your money too tight, you'll actually have less money. All right, let's try it again. I see Milton over here taking notes. So I'm watching you, Milton. So he says, he says, he says, there is that withholdeth more than is appropriate. In other words, God didn't want everything you have. He just wanted you to be generous. Amen? So he says, but if you withhold more than is appropriate, if you're not generous, he said, it will tend to what? Poverty. So I thought, poverty. Nobody really likes that. So poverty or lack, where does it come from? Well, according to this, poverty doesn't come from money you don't have. It comes from money you do have that you shouldn't have. Our money you had, and you ate your seed instead of sowing your seed. Or you spent it instead of sowing it. Isn't that right? So he says, if, if you hold on too tight, so if you're having lack, the first place I examine is how's my giving. All right, let's try this. I got one grunt. Uh, even the pastor almost nodded his head. I said, if... if, if if I'm facing a shortage, come on, the first place I check, hey, how's my sowing doing? How's my giving doing? Because Luke 16 says, if you're faithful in that which is another man, God will give you that which is your own. So my assignment is to be faithful in those supernatural relationships. If I'll do that, then what's going to happen? God's going to make sure I get mine. Y'all know Luke 16, don't you? All right, I got three more nods. So if you're faithful, these are the words of Jesus. I didn't, I didn't make them up. 
One time I, I posted Luke 16, you know, 10, 11, 12 on Facebook. But I didn't put, you know, the scripture reference and stuff. And so I had some of these preachers on there say, that is absurd. I put under there, quote from Jesus. You ever heard of him? So Luke 16. <laughs> If you're faithful when it comes to money, God will commit to you what? True riches. In other words, something better than money. Grace, come on, and blessing come your way. But he said you have to be faithful first with money. You just have to pass the money to you. So faithful with money, then faithful with what? That which is another man? Huh? And then faithful with what? Faithful with little things, it says. So three areas. He said, if you can be faithful in these three areas, he said, I'll bring you into supernatural blessing. Three areas. All right. How's y'all still here? So there he is. That's good. Add that to that sermon you got. So, so there he is. <laughs> hey, have y'all seen that post on Facebook that says, I thought your idea to use my idea was a great idea. <laughs> All right. So. In case you're quoting somebody else, but you forgot their name. Anyway, so <clears throat> there is that withholdeth more than is appropriate, and it tends to poverty. All right, so I had to go over this a bunch of times to get it straight in my head that when I was facing lack or shortage, I needed to make sure that the increase was coming from me scattering. So if I'm afraid to scatter then I'm going to limit my increase. Exactly. All right, so are y'all ready for this? How, this is spiritual law. So how many of you have some other translation? One other translation says it this way and made it easier for me, right? One gives away and gets richer. Another keeps what he should give and is poorer. So I thought, well, I sure don't want to keep what I should give because what I should give is going to make me richer. Amen. So that, that means I take my giving serious just because I take my increase serious. Amen. 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 I got two more grunts. This is going really slow here. So, <laughs> so uh, one gives away, right? A giver, and what happens? Amen. He increases. Praise the Lord. All right, anybody got the message Bible? What's it say? Here, you all ready for the message Bible? The message Bible says what? The world of the generous gets larger and larger. Y'all got that? Is that the message Bible? What's the next part say? The world of the what? Generous, the generous gets larger and larger. And the world of the what? Stingy gets what? What's it say? And become more wealthy, be stingy, and lose everything. Ah, wow. Yeah, there it is. Got it? Give, be a giver. Isn't this crazy? Or you would have to say it this way that the resources in the world were designed to move and come to generous people. Or you could say it this way, there's no shortage of wealth in the world. Matter of fact, if you redistributed all the wealth, there's enough for everybody to be rich. But in five years, everybody would still have what they have, and everybody that lost theirs would still lose what they have because poverty is not a lack of money problem. Come on. It's a thinking problem, and it's a part of the curse. Y'all exactly. still here? So you got to change the way you think. So my dad taught us as kids how to manage money, right? You may have heard me say this before, but my dad would always say, when you get your money in your little hot hand, he, he'd always say it's burning a hole in his pocket. You know what that means? <laughs> yeah, I got to go to the store, man. So he said, when you get your money, <laughs> he said, pay God first, pay yourself second, pay your bills last. You know what that means? Take care of your giving first. Take care of your saving second. Take care of your spending last. In other words, don't spend money 
that's going to keep you from saving money. And don't spend money that's going to keep you from giving money. Thank you for your enthusiasm. So my daddy's saying, here's how to manage money. Because some people could win the lottery. Come on, the stories I like. People can win the lottery and win $5 million until you think, oh, my troubles will be over. There are people that win the lottery that in within three years, they're absolutely broke and worse off than they were before. And they just got $5 million. They are more than that. You say, why? They don't know how to manage money. What's that? Put God first. Don't wait till you spend your money and then figure out to see if you have anything left over for God. I know I'm not talking to most of y'all, but you know who I'm talking to. You know. So, but... <laughs> <laughs> Everybody say, pay God first. That means take care of my tithes and my offerings first. Then put money in saving. Second. So my daddy would say, don't buy everything your little beady eyes want. Do you have any money in saving? So even when Trent and I only made $100, $150 a week, I put money in savings every month. Well, if we've been married 48 years and I put money in savings every month, I got some money in savings and I never took none of it from my giving. Come on, I still did my giving, 30%. Made sure my spending kept it in the right spot and I put money in savings. Well, after 48 years, I put money in savings, put money in a mutual fund, come on, and whatever life insurance I needed. And so now I got some money. People say, how come you got money? Well, I started a long time ago. Come on, not too long ago, I got me a brand new Corvette. And one of the guys in my church, he's trying to be a smart aleck, you know, and he's like, how are you, Pastor? How you get you a new Corvette? I said, from all the money I saved, on, I, I'm not, I don't smoke, so I didn't spend no money on cigarettes. I don't drink Jack Daniels. I don't drink Budweiser. And uh, so all the money I saved on that, I don't do drugs, so I don't need to go to the casino. And so all the money I saved on that, I bought my Corvette. Imagine you could have one too. <laughs> you say, why? Because he was a guy that came to church every once in a while, but he loved to go to the casino. Uh -huh. He liked smoke. Uh -huh. He liked to drink a little bit. What's wrong with that? You broke. One thing is wrong with it. But let me tell you something else. Then he'd show up once a month or once every two months at church. So when I was a pastor, sometimes I'd go out and preach like your pastor does. I'd go out and preach. And so sometimes the Sunday he would come, which would be once every month or two, I would be out preaching. So he came up to me. Uh, one day we were out at the town. He came up to me and said, man, I come to church the other day. I said, well, that's wonderful. He said, you're not there. He said, it gets to where I can never tell whether you're going to be there or not. I said, well, now you know how I feel. All right, so you, you know, you got to have a smart mouth if you're going to survive in the world. So, so, <laughs> how's it feel? All right, so, <laughs> one of the laws of prosperity is what? Proverbs 11, 24. In other words, wealth or abundance in the earth responds to generosity. And there's no shortage of money. If you think there is, go visit Vegas. They spend more on one sign than you spend on your whole church. Just one sign. And people go in there, and they're all happy when they fly in. It's very quiet when they fly out. <laughs> you say, why? You know, they didn't build Vegas on winners. They built Vegas on losers. And even people that win stay there till they lose. And they'll, and they'll risk, you know, what, they, what, the, uh, what is it, the odds? The odds, come on, when they get on those machines, and they'll, they'll uh, advertise, put a big billboard up about somebody that won a million dollars, right? You know what the odds? <laughs> One person out of how many? Five million yeah. uh, win. <laughs> they would rather take those odds than the guarantee in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Come on, and they'll take the risk in Vegas, but won't believe God. 
Thank you for your enthusiasm. That's enough. Uh, my name is Mark Hankins. I approve this message. So I say that for just. So in other words, in other words, when it comes to money, Amen. If you can manage a little, you can manage a lot. There you go. Amen. And the Lord will bring you increase. Praise the Lord. Y'all learn anything from that? All right, somebody tell me one sentence, something you learned real quick. One sentence, something you learned this morning or something stood out to you this morning. One sentence, real quick. One sentence. Nobody? Yes, ma'am. If you don't give, then you're not going to get. Well, uh, that people say people just give to get. Well, uh, Jesus said give and it shall be given to you. Good measure, pressed down. I didn't write that. He said that, so talk to him about it. So he said it'll come back, press down, shake together. Anybody else want to say anything? Yes, sir, in the back. Holler. It's not, it's not money that costs, not money that costs money. Is that, did you have some money that you didn't put God first on? Then that's why you have lack. All right, anybody else? Y'all happy? Praise the Lord. Okay, y'all go ahead and receive the offering because that wasn't what I planned on talking about. Amen. But uh, the biggest giver is what? Everybody say the biggest giver is still here. Amen. Is that good? <laughs> Biggest giver still here. All right, y'all stand up, stretch your legs a minute. Y'all been sitting down a while. Praise the Lord. If you have to go out to go to the bathroom, just put one finger up. That means I'll be right back, and I'm not really mad. Uh, I'm not sure what two fingers means, but don't, I don't want to know. But anyway, so <laughs> but if you need to sneak out and go to the bathroom or get a drink of water, praise the Lord. Uh, feel free to do that, and when you come back in, uh, just uh, sneak in, praise the Lord. Amen. Stretch your legs. Come on. Uh, stretch your arms. Come on. I only have 20 minutes, so this is going to be a fast one, maybe. Maybe so, maybe not. Y'all go out, see if, see if the lunch is ready. The pastor's going to go see what it is. Bring me a plate. Praise the Lord. He's got one finger up, one finger. Beef tenderloin today for lunch. That's for all of the, all of the tithers, <laughs> the, yeah, the non-tithers, uh, we have hot dogs for you. <laughs> Y'all forgive me, but I have to go to church every day of my life. So if I don't have fun in church, I don't have fun nowhere. So praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. There's two restrooms back there. So if somebody stays in there too long, just beat on the door. Just hit the door. <laughs> uh, let's see. Maybe I can think of another joke while they're coming back in. Y'all want me to tell you another joke while they're coming back in? Oh, let's see. Let me tell you this joke. Is my wife in here? Oh, she's telling me. <clears throat> Trinity, you sure you don't? You need to get a drink of water or something? <laughs> Do you need some water? You need some hot tea or something? Oh, just checking. I'm just checking if you need to get some water. You sure? You all right? Give you the word? You sure? You sure you don't need a break? All right, well, I'll tell you this. Uh, they're coming back in. Boudreaux, Boudreaux, this is a Cajun joke. Cajun, this is a Cajun joke. This is a Cajun joke. You know, I'm from Texas, but we've been living in Louisiana, so I have to learn Cajun. So Boudreaux, he and his wife <laughs> live down on the swamp. His wife's pregnant, kind of getting time, you know. And his wife says, Boudreaux, 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 call the doctor, call the doctor. Boudreaux calls the doctor. He's real nervous. He says, doctor, doctor, doctor. He said, the baby's coming. The baby's coming. The doctor said, well, is this her first child? He said, no, you idiot. This is her husband. <laughs> ah. All right, all right, well. One more, one more Boudreaux joke because we still have stragglers coming in. Uh, uh, let's see. What's my other Boudreaux joke about Boudreaux and uh, Clarence? 
All right, this is about Boudreaux and Clarence. <laughs> Boudreaux and Clarence. Boudreaux and Clarence live on the swamp, and they have a feud, you know, a fight, a feud. Been going on for years, Boudreaux and Clarence. So Boudreaux holler across the swamp at Clarence. He said, Clarence, I'm going to come over there and whoop you. Clarence, he'd holler back. Boudreaux, I'm going to come over there and whoop you. That went on for years. Finally, the state of Louisiana built a bridge over the swamp. Don't be talking to people while I'm telling my joke. <laughs> so they built, <laughs> finally, <laughs> this, is, this is significant. So finally they built, Louisiana built a bridge over the swamp. And uh, Boudreaux's wife says, there you go. Go over there and go whoop Clarence. So Boudreaux, man, he starts off across that bridge. He gets about halfway across that bridge. And he turned around and he ran all the way home. He ran home. He's out of breath. His wife said, what's wrong with you, Boudreaux? I thought you were going to finally whoop Clarence. He said, I want to thank the state of Louisiana. I did not know that Clarence was 21 feet and six inches tall. <laughs> he got halfway across the bridge and the sign said, Clarence, 21 feet, six inches. <laughs> so he said, <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Y'all sit down. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Oh, y'all are something. Praise the Lord. Boudreaux. 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 Let me praise the Lord. We're studying on Paul's revelation, so we have a little shorter session here. But truly, a part of Paul's revelation is on uh, giving. So no problem to talk about it, is it? So, uh, but this part is studying Paul's revelation on who you are in Christ. So we started with 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, King James Version says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. Everything has become new. So he describes what happened when you got saved, as he says that you are a new creature creature in Christ. Similar to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 says what? We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Isn't that an amazing scripture? For we are his workmanship created where? In Christ. In other words, God put into Christ everything he wanted you to have. And you were created out of that. Amen. So God did in Christ what he wanted to do in every person. Our God put into Christ everything he wanted you to have. So God's work in Christ. I read Romans 5.20. Romans 5.20, what does it say? Well, it says in the King James, where sin abounded, grace did what? much more abound. This is the grace of God. Amen. So we're sin abound and grace did what much more abound. But Laubach's translation of Romans 5.20 says, God's work in Christ far exceeds any damage done to us by Adam's fall. Ah, I love that translation. I think it's the law book, L-A-U-B-A-C-H. So we, we took uh, the in Christ scriptures and compared them to different translations and started off with about five different translations and it ended up accumulating 121 different translations of the Bible and the New Testament. And so uh, Arthur S. Way's translation of Paul's letters. In other words, he doesn't do the whole New Testament. Arthur S. Way only did Paul's letters. So Arthur S. Way said that the key to the gospel is in the prepositions. Well, when I read that, I thought, now if I'm going to understand who you are in Christ, key to the gospel is in the prepositions. I thought, well, I should have paid attention in English class because a preposition is simply a connecting word that connects you and shows the relationship in that verb or whatever is happening. So a preposition. So example of prepositions are little words like what? For, with, in, through, by, prepositions. 
So Arthur S. Way says in Paul's letters, the key to the Gospels and the prepositions, he said, but the English language was not constructed for a preposition to carry the kind of weight that the Gospel calls upon it to carry. So the prepositions break down under the weight and go almost unnoticed. All right. So what words are we talking about prepositions? You didn't know you were going to get an English lesson. What preposition are we talking about? Well, I learned this from Arthur S. Way. He is translating uh, Paul's letters, and he said that the key to understanding Paul's revelation is the preposition. So he says little words like what? For, with, in, through, and by. Y'all still in here? Well, what would that be for? For simply says in our behalf. Our four shows substitution as our substitute. Let me give you some four examples real quickly here. One of my favorite four scripture is Hebrews 9, 12. It's just one of my favorites. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Or everything Jesus did, he did it what? For us. Us, our other translations say, in our behalf as our substitute. All right, let's go over it one more time. Everything Jesus did, he did it what? For us, set to the credit of our account, which means we were with him. Amen? Identified with him, which now means we are now in him or in Christ or just to break down in Christ. Other translators will say in union with Christ or engrafted into Christ. All right. Now, there is no grafting without wounding. In other words, you're going to graft a plant into the stock of another plant. You're going to have to cut it and it needs an identical cut to be inserted into the stock of that other plant. Then they grow together and become one. All right, so what happened is you got engrafted into Christ. All right, do y'all know Isaiah 53, verse 4 and 5? Y'all know that? Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Surely he has what? Y'all, look at this real quickly here. Come on. We're talking about substitution. All right, we're talking about he did it for us. Surely he has what? Born our griefs. Actually, Isaac Lesser points out that the words griefs and sorrows, they're good words, but actually they could be translated, our sicknesses and carried our pains. Y'all still with me? So surely he hath borne. I wonder if Jesus used that scripture on the road to Emmaus after the resurrection while he's talking to the disciples and opened the scriptures, the Psalms and the prophets, and explained to them the scriptures concerning himself because they didn't know what happened and why it happened in the cross, the death and resurrection of Christ. So what says while Jesus opened to them the scriptures, they said what happened? Their hearts burned within them. See, that's the difference between information and revelation. Information, it tickles your little brain, but revelation makes your heart burn. Fire. Come on. Revelation is, it's our faith is more of a fire than just a formula. In other words, that revelation will, will light you up. And there's a lot of things that can't happen until you get lit. I said until your faith gets lit, I mean. You're just dealing with information. So Jesus opened the scriptures, and very possibly, he probably used Isaiah 53 because he explained from the law of the prophets, from, he explained from the Old Testament, and, and here's what he said. Well, you know, why? Why the cross? Why are you down the cross? Look at this. Surely he has borne our griefs, carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Next verse. But he was what? Wounded. Okay, so there is no grafting without wounding. And for the graft to take, there needs to be an identical cut. So Jesus took our identical condition, and we were inserted and grafted into him. Where did that happen? On the cross. That means if you were there when he was crucified, you were there when he was made alive and raised up. So, surely he has borne. When it says he has borne, go back up there real quickly. Go back up to he has borne. See, born, B-O-R-N-E, 
Born is the Hebrew word, NASA. Surely he has born, or NASA. Surely he has NASA. Surely he did NASA. What, what, what's a NASA? Well, you know in the United States, when they say NASA, what are they talking about? They're talking about space program. Because the word Hebrew word NASA just simply means to lift off. Lift off. And that's what they say, right? 10, 9, 8, 7, 9. Now we have lift off. The word there, lift off, means more than just lift off. It means lift off and carry to a far distance. So what did Jesus do for us on the cross? He has NASA lifted from us and carried far away. Come on, and while you're meditating the Word, and while you're being filled with the Holy Spirit, you can say, there's a liftoff taking place right now. Amen. Amen. What's happening? He's lifting from me my griefs, my sorrows, my shame, the curse, my sickness, my disease. He is lifting that from me, carried it far away, and I'm receiving it right now. Hallelujah. But he was wounded for my transgression, bruised for my iniquities. The chastisement of my peace was upon him, and by his stripes I am healed. Come on, say that. Someone says, by stripe, I am healed. Come on, you ought to get happy about that. Man, you can receive your healing right now. <laughs> I said, you receive your healing right now. Thank you, Lord. By his stripe. Hallelujah. That means I don't have to say sick. I don't have to say broke. I don't have to say uh, in shame. Come on, I have to live my life that way. Why? Something happened on the cross. What happened on the cross? Jesus, what he did, he did it for me in my behalf so I don't have to have it no more. Go ahead and just praise the Lord for a while. Praise the Lord. Woo! He was wounded. Don't read too fast. If you read too fast, we're not trying to do so you can read the fastest. <laughs> Somebody said, we're, we're, we're talking about reading and comprehension here. Yeah. Sometimes people say, I read three books. What'd you get out of it? Oh, I don't know. Well, <laughs> go read it again. So uh, read, yeah, yeah and, and slow down for comprehension and let the Holy Spirit guide you. Sometimes the Holy Spirit will say, whoop, 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 whoop. Go back and look at that. The power of just those two scriptures right there. The power from Numbers chapter 21, what is it, verse 8, 9? I think it's the Numbers 21, 9. Remember when they were getting bitten by poisonous snakes? Isn't that a strange story? I mean, I, that used to freak me out even when I was a kid, you know, reading Sunday school class. And uh, the, the children of Israel out there, you know, traveling, and these poison snakes start biting them, and p many of them are dying. What am I supposed to do? The Lord told Moses, take a serpent, put it on a pole, hold it up, and everybody that looks at it will live. That's really weird, isn't it? You would never think of that, really. I would think of getting a stick and start hitting snakes with it. But, I mean, he says, hey, get a stick. <laughs> but I, I love that story because he says, you take a servant, put it on a pole, which is really the sign that is used in all the hospitals for all the doctors. Come on, and you'll see a picture of number 21, 9. Come on, or a little, uh, a little, uh, what do you, a pen or something, and it'll have a serpent on a pole. Yes. So whoever looks will live. That's why, that's a real mystical thing, isn't it? Because if you get bitten by snakes, for you to turn your eyes away from the snakes and to look at that serpent on a pole, that takes a little bit of self-control. But he said, if you look, you will live. All right, now how many have an Amplified Bible? When it says, whoever looks at it will live, the Amplified Bible says, uh, Trent will help me with this, whoever looks, looks, everybody say look, 
Look, look, look, look. Come on. While you're reading Isaiah 53, come on. And you got serpent. Come on. You got a snake bite. Or you got poison. Or you got a disease. Or you got something that's running and spoiling your life. Come on. Something that could even kill you. He said, quit looking at that. Come on. Don't keep Googling that. You shouldn't know more about your disease than you know about your redemption. Come on, people start studying their disease, man. They know everything about their disease. Are you still here? That ain't going to cure nothing. But when you look to Jesus on the cross and you see that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, he was made a curse for us. Woo, come on. In our behalf. All right, now how did he say to look? Trina, did they put it up amplified? Look at that in the amplified. What's it say? Moses made a serpent of bronze, put it on a pole. If a serpent bitten any man, when he looked at the serpent of bronze, wait, what's that say? Attentively, expectantly, with a steady and absorbing gaze, he lived. In other words, this is no time to have attention deficit disorder. Right? He's just saying, turn your eyes. To Jesus, look full into his wonderful faith. In other words, turn your eyes to what Christ has done for us. Turn your eyes to the scriptures and look at them with a what? What's it say? What? Pay attention now. Come on. Because it's going to determine whether you live or die. If you can't pay attention, come on. My daddy used to say, you know, that guy was so poor, he couldn't pay attention. He said, no, he's poor because he didn't pay attention. Come on. My daddy would always say, ignorance is expensive. So if you're going to stay ignorant and you go stupid, I mean, you're going to be broke. Y'all still here? So that means if you want to receive healing or the cure, there is a cure. Come on, the condition is curable. But your eyes must be turned to the promises of God, to what Christ has done for you, and you must look at them with what? Attentively and what? Expectantly with a what? Steady and what? Absorbing gaze. That means you are flat locked in, baby. Let's try that again. I said, you are locked into Isaiah 53. Come on. And you may be locked in there for the next 30 minutes and people doing all kinds of stuff, but you're saying, oh, but surely he has lifted from me my sicknesses and my diseases, my griefs and my sorrows. He carried it. Thank you, Jesus. Far away. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's wounded for my transgression. Bruised for my iniquities. Come on, go back there. The chastisement of my peace was upon him, and with his stripes. Let's try that one more time. With his stripes. With his stripes. With his stripes. Come on, what you looking at? I said, what you looking at? It's going to determine whether you live or die. Come on, what you looking at? I said, it's going to determine whether you live or die. And a lot of people have been snake bit. Come on now. I said, a lot of people have been snake bit. There's a lot of different ways you can get snake bit. Come on. There's a lot of things that can happen in your life and you get snake bit. And you can talk about the poison. Come on. And you can talk about when it happened, how it happened. Or you can look to the cross and you can look to Jesus and you can see the power of his blood, his death, his resurrection, and keep on looking at it, keep on looking at it, keep on declaring it. And he said, there's a lift off taking place. Come on, say, there's a lift off taking place. Come on, you tell the devil, get that stuff off of me. Get off of me. Come on, I'm redeemed by the blood of Jesus. Get that stuff off of me. Out of my mind, come on now. Come on off of my emotions. Get it off my body. In the name of Jesus, by his stripes, I was healed. By his stripes, I am healed. Come on, you got to fight. There's a fight to faith. 
All right, so when it says by his stripes, we are healed. One translation says by his bleeding wounds. By his what? Bleeding wounds. By his stripes. Surely he has. Whew, come on now. When you're experiencing the pain and the struggle, you got to turn your eyes from the snake and turn your eyes to the cross. And now what did Jesus have to say about this? John 3, 14, 15, 16. What did Jesus say about it? Jesus? Jesus is really the one that connects that to his death. Come on, he connects, even as Moses lifted up the servant of the world, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. What? Look at that. Whosoever believes in him shall not perish, have eternal life. For God so loved the world. David's only without Son, whoever believes in him shall not perish, have what? Everlasting life. So Jesus is the one that connects the serpent on the pole to what happened on the cross. Can you say hallelujah? hallelujah. Everybody say something happened. Yeah. Do you know what happened? Let's try it again. I said, do you know what happened? Come on, that's what we're talking about. What happened? What happened in the scene and what happened in the unseen? Amen. What happened? And so the key to the gospel and the preposition, everything Jesus did, he did it what? For, everybody say for. for. In our behalf, as our substitute, he took my identical condition. When he was wounded, I was engrafted. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. For shows what? Substitution, which means Jesus was not a martyr. He said, no man takes my life from me. You ain't big enough to do that. I just call one angel whoop all y'all. So Jesus is not a martyr. He's not a victim here. He's a substitute. He laid down his life for us. Come on. Whoa. Glory. Are y'all still with me here? Amen. So you got substitution, identification, union with Christ. Now, in Christ, oh, my goodness. Let's see. Let me see if I can give you this real quickly here. Yeah, y'all, y'all need to hang on just for a minute. Can y'all hang on just for a minute here? All right. So everything God did in Christ. So we go from the prepositions of four. What does that mean? Substitution. With shows what? Identification. Still with me? We were crucified. Paul says what? I was crucified what? With him. I was there. Were you there? I was there. Amen. So Paul said, I was there. Christ took me to the cross with him, and I died there with him. Message Bible says, I identified myself completely with Christ. What that means is my identity comes completely from Jesus Christ. I am a new creature in Christ. Come on. And I was crucified with Christ. Who I am is defined by Jesus. What happened on the cross? He said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet not I, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by what? The faith of the Son of God who what? Loved me and gave himself for me. Remember that last phrase. He loved me and gave himself in my behalf. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Can you say praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, for substitution, with identification. In means what? In, engrafted in, in union with. In Christ, in Christ, and there's 35, I said yesterday, significant in Christ scriptures. Now, y'all still with me here? Yeah. Woo! Come on, man. I got like a couple of different roads I can hit right now, but some of them will be like 30 minutes, some will be like an hour and a half. So we're trying to figure out what road and see how hungry you are. So, <laughs> you are who you are in Christ. Come on. Your identification with Christ. Y'all ready? All right, let me give it to you this way. This will be a, a short shortcut. 
Uh, I went, when I went to Bible college, <laughs> uh, I usually kept Kenneth Hagin's books, you know, in the middle of my the theology book. Because theology book weigh about 10 pounds. And uh, Kenneth Hagin's book, you know, real light, paperback, stick it in the middle of that. While the professor's going through all these theories, I just read how to feed your faith. So they wondered why I was always the happiest person in the class. Anyway, so, because I'm not interested in theories. I'm only interested in absolutes. Yes. Amen. Amen. All right. So here's what they said. The theologians all got together, and they said, so much happened on the cross. So much happened on the cross. So much happened on the cross. So much, wow, well, that's, that's true. So much happened on the cross that you cannot explain it just from one view alone. So they said there's four major views that show you and explain what happened on the cross. Four major views. You ready? I'm going to give it to you real quick. Number one, they said, is substitution or satisfaction. Substitution means that that on the cross, Jesus was our substitute. Are y'all still here? Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse uh, 21. What's it say? Y'all know 2 Corinthians 5, 21? For he hath made him to be what? Sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. In him, in him. What happened? On the cross, he was made to be what? Sin for us in our behalf. Sin for us. Now, listen close. When he was made to be sin, he also became everything sin produced. Come on now, stop and look at this attentively, attentively expectantly, with a steady, absorbing gaze. In other words, on the cross, Jesus was made to be what? Sin in my behalf. When he became sin, listen, he never could have died if he had not become sin. But when he became sin, he became what sin produced. What does that mean? Death, sickness, disease, the curse, everything sin produced. That you might be made the righteousness of God in him. So when you make Jesus your Lord, you become a new creature. He says, now you are the righteousness of God in Christ. Do you know how many Christians would believe the first half of that verse and would not believe the second half? It's pretty clear right there that you can, you can not be an unrighteous new creature. We already got one of those. Why would God want to make another one? In other words, when you made Jesus your Lord, you became a new creature, what? In Christ. So you were given the same identical righteousness produced by God. Ha ha. Approved by God. So Romans 4.25, write that down real quickly. Romans 4.25, what does it say? Romans 4.25, y'all got that? That means what happened on the cross is he was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. All right. So what happened is Jesus went to the cross because of our what? Sin. Same thing. He went to the cross because of our sin and was raised for our justification. Same word as righteous. So Jesus went to the cross because of our sin and he was raised when we were declared righteous. So... Jesus was not raised from the dead until the penalty for sin was paid in full. Once it was paid in full, you were declared not guilty. Or you were declared righteous. So once you were declared not guilty, you were declared righteous. I got another side of this story. Once you were legally in the eyes of the Supreme Court of the universe by God himself declared, come on, not guilty, penalty paid in full, you have been declared righteous, God himself walked across that righteousness and gave you the same life that he gave to Christ. Hallelujah. And made you alive together. Boy, you ought to get happy already. He made you righteous. 
which means you're free from a sense of sin or guilt. Listen, and in the New Testament, the blood of Jesus not only cleanses from sin, but it removes sin consciousness. All right, let's try it one more time. I said the blood of Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit reaches into the heart of the believer and removes not only sin, but silences every voice of self-condemnation. I don't know if I can help you if you don't like that. In other words, yeah, I said the blood of Jesus reaches into the heart of the believer by the power of the Holy Spirit, silences every voice that says you don't measure up, you're not good enough, you fail too much, you need to try harder, come on, and reaches into your heart and says you are 100% righteous, produced by the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. That qualifies you for God's best blessings because you are the righteousness of God in Christ. Praise the Lord. Now, I'm telling you, I'm getting happy about that. Because I always knew we were saved. I mean, I grew up in church. They said, you're saved. Thank God I'm saved. Well, you're going to heaven? Well, I'm pretty sure. But uh, I'm saved. But when I found out I was the righteousness of God in Christ, I went, glory to God. God looks at me like I never did nothing wrong. Boy, that is amazing. Come on, he sees you through the blood. Yes. Come on, look at Colossians 1, verse 20 through 22 real quickly here. Through the blood of his cross, Colossians 1, 20, and then go through verse 22. Through the blood of his cross, by him reconciled all things to himself. I say, whether things in the earth or things in heaven, verse 21. And you that were sometime alienated enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now has he reconciled. Look at this, verse 22. In the body of his flesh, through what? Death. To present you what? Holy, unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. In other words, the blood of his cross does what? Presents you in his presence. He sees you through the blood. Holy, unblameable, unreprovable. One translation says without a single fault. Come on. Preaching on sin consciousness has never produced righteousness. Huh? I mean, you may sound mean and rough and tough. I tell you, I'm against sin, you know. Well, we're all against sin, not it. Listen, but the, the only cure is the blood of his cross. Come on. The only cure is the blood of Jesus. Amen. So recognizing the power of that blood through the blood of his cross, now God sees you through the blood. Come on. And he looks at you like you never did nothing wrong. And you do what? Most of the time, you cry because that kind of love, the reality of that kind of love, it breaks you down. That's what broke me down. I mean, I'm a preacher's kid, so I'm pretty rough. You know, I can handle stuff. But when I got a revelation of the love of Christ, it just broke me down. I mean, I heard it, but I personally experienced the love of Christ. And I went, oh, my God, I surrender all. Let's try that again. I surrender all. What does that mean? I'm out, baby. I'm out. Jesus just knocked me out, man. With what? With his love. All right? So there's four major views. Now, I'm going to give you this, and I'm going to quit. Four major views of what happened on the cross and how it saves us. Number one is substitution satisfaction. Claims of justice were satisfied. Jesus raised from the dead. You were declared righteous. That's why all you got to do believe Romans 10, 9, and 10. Confess your mouth. Jesus, Lord, believe in your heart. God, what? Raise you from the dead. Verse 10, with the heart, what? You believe? With the mouth. Confession made to salvation. And that's it, baby. No, we don't have any other list. Amen. And most people are like, Really? Yeah, yeah, really. And your confession that Jesus is Lord, in other words, what happened on the cross, how it saves us, substitution satisfaction. Number two, number two, write this down real quickly here, and I'll talk about it next time I come, so don't act like you already know it. 
I said, next time I come, if I'm teaching, I'm saying, he taught that last year. Don't even remember that. Yeah, I do remember that, but you didn't pay attention, so that's why I'm doing it again. So, are you ready for this? <laughs> Number two. <laughs> Number two, they call it the ransom view. The ransom view, which simply means this. Man was held hostage by a power greater than himself, by which there was no means of escape. On the cross... Jesus entered death on an assignment. Y'all see with me? In other words, on the cross, he's our substitute, but he's actually, through death, going to destroy him that has the power of death. So he enters into death on an assignment to do what? Pay the price in full. The hostage gets released, and he destroys him that has the power of death. All right, the key scripture with this, with this view is 1 John 3, 8. Uh, oh, my, several, uh, uh, Colossians 2, 15, spoil principalities and powers. 1 John 3, 8, you know 1 John 3, 8? What does it say? For this purpose, Son of God is manifested that he might what? Destroy the works of the devil. <laughs> so Jesus, come on. In his earth ministry, he definitely did that. But his greatest effectiveness in 1 John 3, 8 happened on the cross. To destroy the works of the devil and to destroy him that had the power of death and to spoil principalities and powers and to make a show of them openly. So he entered into death to do what? To destroy him that had the power of death or to destroy the works of the devil. How many of y'all got some other translations? You got an amplified Bible? You might can throw it up there real quickly there. 1 John 3, 8, to destroy... <laughs> to destroy the works of the devil. How many of y'all see this amplified? And the, the word destroy is the Greek word luo, which means to destroy, loosen, and dissolve. Ha! Ah, so in the name of Jesus, come on, by the power of the blood of Jesus, come on, that, that blood can do what? Destroy, loosen, dissolve. Come on, you got a definition of dissolve? That means that something was there and now it ain't. Dissolve means, come on, it's to melt it to a liquid and boil it to a vapor so that it, ain't, it doesn't even exist. You have no evidence it was ever there. So when God raised Christ from the dead, exceeding great power was enough power to do what? To destroy. Dissolve. Luo comes from the Greek word that's used in 1 Thessalonians that says in the last days, the earth will melt with fervent heat. The, all the elements will melt down with fervent heat. You know, you're concerned about global warming. This is going to be a serious problem because the elements, the whole earth is going to be like renovated and go into a meltdown. That's really what it means, a meltdown. So in Chernobyl, come on, when Russia, what happened? What happened is they had a meltdown. So much energy and power was released that they could not stop it. They could not contain it. And it actually affected miles, hundreds of miles away, affected the dirt, the, the cows. It affected everything. What happened? Such tremendous power was released. So years later now, you can visit Chernobyl, but they only let you stay there for a while just to kind of observe. And then you get on the bus and you leave. And very few people miss that bus. Because while you're in Chernobyl, come on, if you had a Geiger counter or something like that to measure power, come on, there's power in the dirt, power in everything. If you stay there long enough, you're going to glow in the dark. Yeah. <laughs> right, but now listen, that's power that does not register on your senses. So that means even if you don't feel like it's there, it's there. Go ahead and just laugh for a minute. I said, even if you don't, come on, you say, I don't feel no power. I don't feel like, uh, baby, there's some power there, and you better catch the bus to get out of Chernobyl when you can because there's some power working there. Come on. And in the gospel, there's some power. No matter how you feel, <laughs> exceeding great power, and now your faith in the power of God and your confession of Jesus as Lord and the power of what happened will do what? Destroy Destroy a tumor. 
Dissolve the tumor. Dissolve cancer. Dissolve arthritis. Drive sickness out of your body. Drive depression out of your mind. Come on now, the power that raised Christ from the dead dissolve. Woo! Come on, that means the mountain was there and now it's not there. What happened to it? It disappeared, baby. It disappeared. Somebody ought to get happy already. Come on. <laughs> Every cancer cell dies in the power of the name of Jesus and the power of the blood of Jesus. I said, Every cancer cell dies. I said, every cancer cell dies in the name of Jesus. Woo, come on now. From the top of your head to the soles of your feet. Come on, radiation power of the gospel of Christ by the blood of Jesus. Come on now, to loosen and set you free. Hallelujah. Loosen and to dissolve. Come on now. Woo. Lift off. I said, lift off. I said, it lifts it off of me. Get off of me in the name of Jesus. By the blood of Jesus. Get off of me in the name of Jesus. Jesus paid it all. Woo! So I go free. Hallelujah. All right, here's the picture. You've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. What's, what's Malachi 4 2 say? Anybody know Malachi 4 2? Come on, it's almost like at the last. Last verse, really, in the, in the Old Testament. Unto you that fear my name or reverence my name, or other translations say what? Worship. Unto you that worship my name, shall what? The son of righteousness arise with what? Healing in his wings. And other translations say in his beams. In other words, you get in the light of the revelation of the gift of righteousness and you come out in that light and there's healing in those beams. And then what's going to happen? And you shall go forth and grow up like calves released from the stall. I know. Some of y'all say, well, I ain't coming back tomorrow. He preached too long today, so I don't care. I ain't going to be here anyhow. So, so he said, <laughs> we got your food for you, so at least you don't have to go wait in line nowhere. Come on. And you shall go forth and do what? Grow up like a calf released from a stall. What does that mean? It basically means this. You come out of a little stall, a little place, into a wide open place, and you're leaping like a calf coming out of the stall. Come on, go ahead and get a picture of yourself coming out of a little place, coming out to a big place. Come on. And you're healed now. I said you're healed now. You're blessed now. You're redeemed now. Come out of a little place, jump and say, look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. Come on, the son of righteousness. Come on. And healing is now working in my body, making me well. Woo. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All right, let me finish this. Number two is what? Ransom view is Jesus did what? He entered death basically to overthrow the devil. It's where we get the term Jesus is Lord. And the overriding emphasis of Lord means victor or champion. In other words, he got his name through conquest. So when you say his name in the name of Jesus, Every demon knows that you know. In the name of Jesus, he is Lord. What does that mean? Through death, through conquest, he spoiled principalities and power. All right. That's number what? Two? Number three is the sermon all by itself, which was the one I was going to preach this morning. Number three is called the blood covenant. Man, I like this one. The blood covenant. Through the blood of the everlasting covenant. In other words, what happened on the cross, the death and resurrection of Christ, is we have a new covenant based on the blood of Jesus. Better blood, better promises, better sacrifice. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The blood covenant and the study on the blood covenant is phenomenal, which we don't have time to do this morning. That's number three. Through the blood, through faith in his blood. 
All right, and number four. Number four is simply called love. Love. Everybody say love. love. Or the God kind of love. In other words, how does what happened on the cross, how does it save us? Because nobody ever loved you like Jesus. Amen. Even though you can't explain the first three, when you see the love of Christ, you start heading to Jesus. Amen. I said, even if you can't explain the first three, when you see the love of Christ on the cross, his death, you're like, nobody loved me like that. So when I was younger, you know, I said, I wrote a song called Jesus Loved the Hell Out of Me. And some guy wrote a song about it. He heard me preach on it, so he wrote a song. Jesus loved the hell out of me. I don't, and I, I, I don't necessarily endorse that song. But, but I got the phrase, Jesus loved the hell out of me from when I was 17 years old. Because I knew the Bible, right? But I was 17, I got a revelation of the love of Christ, which means what? Well, been to school, they tried to educate the hell out of me. Went to jail, they tried to rehabilitate the hell out of me. Went home, my daddy tried to beat the hell out of me. Went to church, they tried to preach, preach the hell out of me. But when I went to Jesus, he loved the hell out of me. Come on, that's I mean, I surrender, man. Nobody, nobody ever cared for me like Jesus. Woo, even if I'm mad at other people at church, nobody ever cared for me like Jesus. So believe me, I didn't come for you. I came because of him. Hallelujah. I love him. Amen. I'm glad to see you, but I ain't quitting because of what he did. Whatever you do is your business, but I'm still going to follow Jesus because nobody loved me like Jesus. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, lift your hands up. Thank God. Thank you, Lord, for the word. Thank you, Lord, for the word. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Come on, Christ has redeemed us. I said Christ has redeemed us. He purchased our freedom with his blood. Stand up on your feet and shout about it. Praise the Lord. I said shout about it. Praise the Lord. I'm redeemed by the blood. Say, ha, ha, ha. Come on, even if I don't feel it, I said, even if I don't feel it, come on, there's some power working right now in my spirit, soul, and body. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. No matter how I feel. Woo. Come on, I'm redeemed. Come on now. From the top of my head to the soles of my feet, I am healed, I am whole, I am redeemed, I am blessed, I am strong. Come on now, laugh at the devil, say, ha! Christ redeemed me. Jesus paid it all. <laughs>